to be introducing my colleague, John Makalanas, today, who will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. John is a professor and chair of the Department of uh, Microbiology and Immunology at Harvard Medical School, and he is a world expert in the genetics and biochemistry of how pathogenic bacteria grow, and even worse, evade our immune systems and ultimately cause disease. He received his PhD from UCLA. He came to Harvard Medical School to do a postdoc, and then he stayed here. He was appointed to the faculty in 1981, and he's been chair of his department since 1996. He has won numerous awards, and to name just a few, the Eli Lilly Award in 1991, the uh, AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize in 1994, the Harvard Ledley Prize in 97. He was elected to the US, US National Academy of Sciences in 1998. And in a week or so, he will be in Paris, where he will be receiving the Sanofi Institut Pasteur Award for Biomedical Research. His talk today is called River Monster, the Epidemiology, Ecology, and Pathobiology of Cholera. And that sounds really scary. It Thank should. you, John, for coming. Thank you, John, so much. Well, it's a kind of a Halloween, you know, <laughs> seasonal title. Um, plus, if you guys, any of you are fishermen, you know the program on TV. Then it's great about uh, the fellow that goes to uh, wonderfully exotic places to catch uh, uh, mythical fish. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I thought I'd have fun with that title. So it's a pleasure to be here. It really is, and I hope uh, what I'm going to, you know, accomplish today is to give you a feeling for uh, this monster, this organism, Vibrio cholera, and the disease that causes cholera, because it's been in the news, and it actually uh, is really a pretty big motivational factor for governments, for agencies, for global health uh, institutes, donors, etc., cetera, to, uh, to really pay attention to the issue of water as it relates to pathogenesis and, well, really human health, because uh, there's really no other organism that is more, uh, you know, the arch enemy of dirty water than than uh, Vibrio cholera, and um, represents, in fact, um, the organism, if you will, that uh, has shaped history direct, dramatically as a result of uh, those properties. So I know not everyone's an expert in this room, so I'm going to try to keep this pretty light and uh, not too technical today, but I do have to touch upon some of the research going on in our laboratory and in the field and as a whole to give you an appreciation for the multifaceted nature of this problem. So first of all, the organism is a bacterial uh, organism. As it turns out, it's gram-negative, it's modal, it's got all these properties, but the, the main thing that we know it for is the fact that it is the causative agent of the epidemic disease cholera. And this is an acute intestinal infection that really results in 80% uh, of the time really a lethal diarrhea if, if a patient uh, shows symptoms. Uh, it actually doesn't show sh symptoms all that often. Maybe 10% uh, of the time a patient actually does have diarrheal disease uh, symptoms. Uh, but the other 90% of the time, they'll, they'll frequently be exposed to the organism and generate an immune response um, and not really show severe uh, disease, which, you know, is a, in a way, is a remarkable thing in and of itself because it, it tells you the bacterium is in pretty close um, balance with the host, if you will. It's not out to necessarily kill its victims, um, but it is out to disseminate itself, and if it can disseminate itself without disease symptoms, great, but um, when worse comes to worse, the organism causes uh, this diarrheal syndrome, which we all believe in the field. Uh, really is uh, driving the evolution of the organism as a, um, as a transmissible um, pathogen, if you will. But I'll, I'll come back to that issue in a moment. And it's still endemic in much of the developing world, as shown on this slide. Um, every few years, a uh, dramatic event occurs. Uh, Zoma's, Goma Zaire, the refugee camps and the civil war that occurred there, resulted in about 50,000 deaths, uh, untold hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cases. Um, there have been many other epidemics in Africa, and most recently Haiti uh, has been in the news, and there's been about 7,000 deaths in Haiti and um, close to 700,000 cases. So a little bit about the epidemiology of the 
of uh, cholera. There, there's been recognized uh, to be six uh, pandemics prior to 1961, and those uh, pandemics are thought to be caused by uh, a type of the organism called a classical strain. I'm mentioning this only for uh, discussion purposes later because I'll be comparing and contrasting so-called classical strains with El Tor strains. Uh, in 1961, uh, the seventh pandemic uh, began with the emergence of a new strain, uh, easily recognizable by standard biochemical properties, as uh, an organism called O1L Tor. Uh, it was actually first recognized in a quarantine camp in Saudi Arabia associated with the Hajj, but, uh, but emerged as a pathogen in 1961 in the Celebes Islands. Now, uh, that strain didn't take very long, only four years, to roar onto the uh, continent and uh, begin in, in um, a, a giant epidemic in Hong Kong, of all places, a place, as you, a place you might think has uh, great water uh, in 1965, but it didn't. And they had over 100,000 cases, as it turns out, as I recall from uh, reading that literature. And then it uh, established itself in the Indian subcontinent, India, Bangladesh, the Ganges Delta, eventually moved to Africa by 1970. And in 1991, pretty much 30 years later, it roared onto uh, the shoreline of uh, South America in the form of an epidemic that is arguably uh, somewhat controversial because there's some papers that suggest it began as a sporadic disease on the coastline for a few years and then finally emerged in epidemic form in Lima. That has still not been completely resolved, but I'll touch upon that, I hope, later with some genomic information. Um, that strain uh, established itself uh, endemically in Latin America and Central America. You can still find the strain causing cholera in Central America, in particular um, uh, the southern part of Mexico, the Chiapas region. And it undergoes some variation, but by and large, what I'm trying to let you know is that this is one strain that is pandemically spreading. It's moving globally. It's staying very much the same. And the question is, ecologically, how does that work? Is that driven by human travel? Is that driven by environmental factors? We still don't know, but I hope I can touch upon some of this today. And here's another example of something where we get a, you know, a little snapshot of the history of cholera. So in 1990, uh, two, the organism emerged in a new serogroup. These are O1 and O139. You can tell that there were a lot of serogroups in between that never pulled off what this one did, and that was cause disease in an endemic population. Usually adults are resistant to cholera because they're immune, having been exposed earlier in their life. Adults were sensitive to this strain, so it had a new surface antigen. But what I'll let you know right now is that the backbone of that strain, genetically, its genomic information, was exactly the same as the seventh pandemic strain. It just swapped out a cluster of genes that allowed it to change its surface structure. So again, another smoking gun that this was a special backbone already, and the only way that something could change was to change on top of that backbone if it was going to be successful. Now, luckily, O139 has remained uh, confined to the Indian subcontinent, has not spread to Africa, has not spread elsewhere in the world except occasional traveler's case. So uh, still something you know, may be missing, but it's an interesting story to say, you know, today there are really basically two serogroups groups that are highly related to each other. They cause all the cholera in the world today. That is epidemic, uh, or to some extent, uh, reliably endemic, uh, seasonal epidemic that occurs again and again in the same uh, geographical location. And one thing I want, want to you know, put into your back of your mind to remember later, if I mention, is that the O antigen, the O1 and the O139, these serogroups are also receptors for bacteria or viruses that are called vibriophages in the case of vibrio cholera. And bacterial viruses are just what they say. They're viruses that grow on bacteria, and they can actually kill bacteria, among other things. Uh, it's an important part of the epidemiology story that I want to tell you today. So uh, I'll leave it at that for right now and come back to that later. So great reads on cholera. Uh, Drew Faust's husband, Charlie uh, Rosenberg, uh, wrote this wonderful uh, piece about uh, cholera in the United States and how it, how it shaped social structure and uh, just a wonderful read. Uh, if you're interested, it's almost, it's, it's kind of a little bit like the HIV epidemic all over again. Cholera was represented at that time as being something that defined your 
class and your your place in society and it was really quite amazing how uh, people thought that if you were of the privileged class you were never going to be exposed to this disease there was something special about you and they were proven wrong and it changed the whole way uh, a lot of different categories of interaction of, uh, of people in society occurred as a result of that no one was spared um, and um, the other uh, very well done book by Stephen Johnson is called The Ghost Map and this focuses in on the uh, on the work uh, and the history of this gentleman and you probably can guess who it is um, he was really the founder of the field of epidemiology he made observations like this and published on them a German steamer pulls into London in September of 1848 Hamburg uh, its port of uh, departure had cholera there was no cholera in London a crewman uh, got off Checked into a boarding house, completely healthy. A few days later, he died of cholera, September 22nd. Next person to stay in the room died of cholera, September 30th, and then the epidemic began. And uh, it was these kinds of observations that convinced, you know who it is, John Snow, that in fact cholera was spread by the movement of, of people, and that the question really was what was being spread. And he was uh, being battled at the time by a large number of uh, the physicians and scientists of the day that felt that cholera occurred in places that smelled bad. And this continued to uh, plague uh, many of the early um, microbiologists and epidemiologists is that there were a lot of people that said, well, of course, whenever there's cholera around, it just smells bad. It must be, it must be transmitted by the vapors, the miasma, some strange, uh, uh, you know, ether-like material that has to do with our ability to sense odors. Well, uh, indeed, he, he really founded the field by, by developing the ghost map, the map of the, of the individuals that died of cholera uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the epidemic of, I think it was uh, 18, uh, boy, 49, I believe it was. It wasn't this epidemic. It was one that followed. But the, uh, the story uh, was, was basically correct, that uh, he could tell by mapping out fatalities and the habits of those fatalities that, in fact, it wasn't that you lived in the wrong neighborhood. You could live in the wrong neighborhood. You just had to be willing to walk five blocks away for your water. And if you use this water from the Broad Street pump, you're in trouble. So by, by mapping out that kind of risk factor to location to other behaviors, he really founded the ability to do an investigation of an epidemic and come to a conclusion. Now, he didn't put the lock on the pump, but he did talk to the local officials that shut down the Broad Street pump and, and now has the, uh, the lore, if you will, of stopping the epidemic by stopping people from collecting water out of that pump. Anyway, it's a great read. If you go back to those books, you, you can, uh, you, the, you, the brilliance of this guy in light of no knowledge of microbiology um, figuring out that this was a disease transmitted by water and that somebody had to block that transmission to stop the epidemic. So now a little bit about the environment and the organism because I think this should interest a few people in the audience. So there's 70 species of the genus called Vibrio and most of them are free-living inhabitants of, of uh, saline, uh, let's just say salty environmental water environment. Some are commensals, that is, they, they don't cause any harm. In fact, they cause benefit for the organisms they inhabit. So, for example, Vibrio fisheri is a, an essential organism for the light organs of squid. They use the light to, to hide themselves and to some extent hunt. And in fact, uh, this organism produces that light through bioluminescence. And if you get rid of the organism out of a squid system, it doesn't even develop a light organ. So the squid are intimately tied to wanting that vibrio inside their body, uh, starting a developmental program that leads to the, uh, a very successful uh, organ for uh, the biology of squid and the ecology of squid. Some are pathogens, though. Vibrio harvii is uh, not a commensal of shrimp. Usually when you find Vibrio harvii in shrimp, you got a dead shrimp. So it just specializes in uh, attacking shrimp, and it's a big problem for aquaculture uh, of shrimp. Um, but then there are others, like Vibrio parahemolyticus, that, you know, it pretty much attacks a lot of different things. You'll find it in oysters, so frequently the, the situation is somebody eats bad raw oysters, and they end up with a tummy ache. And uh, 
invariably, uh, you know, if it's investigated carefully, it's usually Parahemolyticus inside those oysters, sometimes Wolnificus, another Vibrio species. So it can, it can grow in oysters and make oysters sick. And if somebody uh, is a bad shucker and gives you a bad oyster because they don't smell that that oyster is something wrong with it, that's it. You get it too. So it's not happily sitting there doing nothing to the oyster. Usually the oyster is on the edge of going under too. It's a, it's a nasty Vibrio that attacks oysters and humans. Vibrio cholera is more controversial. So my colleague Rita Caldwell has done some lovely work on the environmental distribution of Vibrio cholera and uh, really uh, remarkable observations about the organism's ability to bind to these uh, egg uh, encasings uh, that these uh, aquatic, uh, if they, if you will, insects, they're tiny insects, they're zooplankton, but they're arthropods and, and Vibrio cholera seems to have a high affinity for those. So she's popularized the theory that uh, that correlations between blooms of arthropods of this sort, particularly uh, copepods and cholera in places like Bangladesh, uh, suggest that this is an intimately tied to the cycle of cholera in an endemic location like Bangladesh. And of course, like all things, you can correlate this with numerous other parameters, temperature, salinity, available carbon in the water, which is usually a reflection of photosynthesis going on in the water, aquatic hosts like copepods, bacterial predators are even possible. I'll come back to that in a moment. I think, I think she would agree, nothing really has been proven here. There's a lot of correlations and it's very hard to do uh, a definitive experiment. So I'm gonna come back to that later and give you a few other views of the difficulty in that problem. Um, but the fact is, if there's an aquatic reservoir for Vibrio cholera, it's very difficult to define, and it depends on how you define the Vibrio cholera, and that's what I'm gonna shift on to in, a, in the next few slides. So here's the cycle uh, of disease. Clearly, it's, a, it's acquired by oral ingestion of contaminating food or water. If you ingest a sufficient enough dose, and that is a qualifier there because we're starting to learn things about its infectivity and how big the dose needs to be, um, if it gets through the acid barrier, it's very sensitive to acid, acid, then it adheres to the intestine and starts to multiply. And there are virulence factors that are involved in each one of these. So you'll hear me refer to TCP, it stands for toxin co-regulated pillus, or CT, it stands for cholera toxin. This is the big gun. You know, if you ingest, you, if two Maryland, two Maryland medical students volunteered for a study where they ingested two and a half micrograms each of cholera toxin. And um, it was with bicarbonate to neutralize it. And they each had 20 liters of diarrhea. Now, this would be lethal, right? But they knew that cholera is a very, very safe disease. Once you know you have it, you can treat it. You can replace the fluid and electrolytes. There really wasn't uh, anything wrong with the informed consent of that experiment. But that sure proved that <laughs> that that toxin can reproduce the whole diarrheal disease syndrome that is lethal in a human. Well, you could say that's the whole business end. And in fact, uh, without cholera toxin, Vibrio cholera does not replicate very well in the intestine. It's about tenfold down at least. It still replicates, but it's, you know, you can think of it as 90% defective in its replication. And when you have that diarrheal disease syndrome, there's 10 to the eighth bacteria per milliliter. And if you lose 10% of your body weight, you can figure out 70 kilograms, what, seven liters, you're dead, and 70 liters of toxigenic Vibrio cholera at 10 to the eighth have been dumped into the environment somewhere. You can see how this can drive dissemination of the organism very efficiently. Uh, this is a very important thing too because it says toxin co-regulated pillows, and now I want, to, I want to just touch upon that in a little bit more detail, but I don't want to forget to say that there is still possible that these factors play something to do with environmental persistence and not just disease. My personal feeling is I don't think so, but there is some evidence uh, that might suggest that. And I don't want to be so arrogant as to say, I don't believe it. Uh, you know, that, that structure, for example, might have some affinity for chitin. And chitin is one of the most, you know, abundant carbon sources, you know, in water. So, you know, sure, maybe chitin drove some of this, but the reality is there are many, many Vibrio cholera that metabolize chitin and don't have the genes for TCP. If you don't have the genes for TCP, you cannot colonize a human efficiently. 
Okay, and I'll come back to that in a moment too. And infectivity, I do want to uh, mention. I will say several times uh, in this lecture about infectivity. Suffice to say that we measure that by saying what's the minimum dose of Vibrio cholera to infect an experimental animal. And these experiments have been done with, with, with uh, human volunteers as well, safely, I'll emphasize. Okay, so uh, a couple of other pieces of science because I think it, it continues to emphasize that not all Vibrio cholera are the same. If you're a Vibrio cholera and you're TCP positive, you're in a special case. And you could be an environmental strain, as it says in the slide. But why you're a special case is that there's another virus called the CTX phage that encodes cholera toxin. And that, that virus actually utilizes that structure for its way into the cell. If you build the structure, it injects its DNA in, and then you have a Vibrio cholera that is toxin plus and TCP plus. That's your killer. That's your pathogenic strains. So you're going to hear the word viruses a lot in this lecture. But, uh, you know, in this particular case, the viruses are doing no harm to Vibrio cholera. In fact, it's giving Vibrio cholera its single biggest gift, which is cholera toxin, as a pathogen. That's what's making it a successful pathogen. Um, so it, it becomes always, it's always more complicated. But, you know, here's really the reality. If you go to the environment and you look for Vibrio cholera, the species, Vibrio cholera, is all over the planet. You'll find it occasionally in seawater, more often in brackish water environments. It likes a little bit of fresh water, not a lot of fresh water, but it likes some. Uh, and what you'll find is that those strains lack TCP and they lack cholera toxin phage. So you have to acquire first a chunk of DNA for the receptor for the phage. Then you can get the phage, then you have both, and then you need some regulatory genes to control everything. So that's your, you know, the, the, the simplest version of the evolution of pathogenic strains, acquisition of at least two new chunks of genetic material. Um, all these strains uh, from 1817, as best we can tell, the classical, they had these, they acquired them, but the seventh pandemic strain acquired them again, if you will. The elements, TCP and cholera toxin, are different in the seventh pandemic strain. So the strain re-emerged uh, with a new backbone. And, and included in that backbone were a couple of other pieces of island DNA that encode new properties. And I'm not going to talk about it today, but Vibrio seventh pandemic island one, we've just recently published that that is an infectivity island. That really uh, enhances infectivity of Vibrio cholera. And that's all I'm going to say about it today. If you're interested afterwards, I can tell you mechanistically more about that. It's also acquired elements that encode antibiotic resistance. But in the end, these variants that exist today are now more virulent and more toxigenic by in vitro tests, by animal tests. They are becoming hypervirulent, not hypovirulent. Uh, some evolutionary biologists always believe, why kill your host? You always evolve toward less virulence. The only reason why you kill your host is transmission, as it turns out. So my feeling is the smoking gun in the genetics is that this bug wants to become more and more transmissible. And if we provide, it, provide the organism with environments that allow transmission, like lousy water, game over. It's just going to get more and more virulent. And I think we're seeing it already uh, in much of the world that has endemic cholera. Now, a little bit of uh, what amounts to sad politics, really, because uh, this was an example of uh, one of the... Uh, one of the saddest things I've experienced in decades of research in cholera was the uh, unwillingness of people to really learn from Jon Snow. And basically, uh, cholera remained out of the Western Hemisphere for 100 years, 1991. Finally, uh, the seventh pandemic strain made it into Peru, and there's some controversy how that happened. Um, researchers, uh, including some of my own colleagues at Harvard, uh, came to the conclusion that because it corresponded to an El Nino year, and you heard about that, in other lectures, if you've attended this series, um, it might have been, you know, uh, a, a ocean warming event that made conditions right for cholera to uh, establish itself in Latin America, perhaps because some bystander organism bloomed that Vibrio cholera utilized as a secondary host. Who knows? These theories were out there and sometimes are even quoted as fact. Oh, cholera was caused by El Nino. Uh, believe it, there is not real data on that, it happened to happen on an El Nino year, but there's been lots of El Ninos before that that never caused cholera in Latin America. Uh, and despite the fact that Haiti is very, very close to Latin America and Central America that has the seventh pandemic strain causing cholera, Haiti was cholera free. 
and only 12% of Haiti households have pot potable water. Cholera free, right? January 2010, magnitude 7 earthquake absolutely smashes the country. 300,000 people dead, 1.5 million people homeless, a tragedy. Um, but my own colleagues, people I know, you know, never really uh, got, you know, to the grips of the problem here and realized uh, that there was tremendous opportunity for color to establish itself in Haiti. They made these kinds of comments that the risk was extremely low. Cholera hasn't been in Haiti for 100 years. You know, that means that the organism didn't crawl out of the water environment and attack Haiti before, so it's not going to attack it now. Well, there's a problem. John Snow says cholera is transmitted by humans, right? By people pump, poop, pooping in the water, to use you know, the word that I like to use with my daughter now. And then. But, so, so uh, you know, this was a ridiculous decision that, that uh, there was very little risk for Haiti. They should, uh, should never have made this statement. And um, I'm sorry, I have to, I, I, can, I get confronted by my colleagues all the time. But I said, you know, that was an unwise thing to make a call. It was a political statement to uh, try to, you know, produce cover for, uh, for decisions that were made. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the bottom line is that uh, in October, 10 months after the earthquake, the infrastructure was smashed for 10 months. Nothing happened. Now, I could show you charts of temperature, copepod concentrations, carbon in the water. You know, it's all after the fact. The bottom line is it's a tropical country. The, the temperature doesn't vary that much. The water temperature of the oceans and everything, the atmospheric temperature, nothing varies that much. Ten, Ten months after the earthquake, suddenly cholera breaks out. Excuse me if that was me. I'm a little more animated. Anyway, you, know, you all know this. Probably you've read it in the news. Excuse me. So how did cholera get to Haiti? Well, um, two, two theories have been uh, uh, pushed. One is an environmental source. Maybe it was the Latin American strain. Maybe it was newly emerged. Maybe it was the Gulf Coast strain, which is yet again a different strain that causes sporadic cholera, not epidemic cholera in the Americas, or it was a human source. It came from the outside, a relief worker, a security force, whatever. Anyway, uh, the Haitians had a different opinion of this. Uh, the first case of cholera appeared on October 19th. By November 1st, the CDC did uh, do an astronomically fast effort of characterizing the strain and announced publicly that the strain looked by pulse field gel electrophoresis and analytical technique to be of South Asian origin. Couldn't say anything more. Uh, riots began uh, in Port-au-Prince around the time of uh, cholera initial uh, breakout in Port-au-Prince, and it was directed at UN uh, peacekeeping forces, particularly from Nepal, because it didn't take uh, you know, a lot of investigative effort to figure out that cholera broke out very close to a UN peacekeeping camp well, that was uh, that was inhabited by uh, troops from Nepal. So this is you know a very short a version of a longer story. If you're interested in reading the story, you can come back. Uh, cholera was endemic throughout Nepal in the second week of September. The troops arrived October 9th, 12th, and 16th. The first case was October 14th. It was correlated with bad sanitary conditions at the camp that were quickly cleaned up after cholera broke out. But investigative work by fantastic, uh, you know shoe leather epidemiologists that interviewed a lot of people that were on the ground, got you know roughed up and physically thrown out of the camp uh, when they asked the wrong questions, uh, really established that this is where the earliest cases occurred. And you can see from the elevation, this is a hilly area. This is nowhere near the coast. It's only a thousand meters from where the UN camp was. There's too many smoking guns here, but nonetheless, Colleagues like my, my friend Rita Caldwell, you know, she got into the press and said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. It's an environmental phenomenon. It came out of the water. It had nothing to do with people, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> we couldn't take it. So honestly, I, a bunch of us in this community, uh, big uh, applaud to Matt Waldor, who's a Hughes investigator at the, women, uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Steve Calderwood, who had folks on the ground in Haiti helping deal with the disaster, taking care of patients. Um, uh, John Charles, uh, Haiti Health Minister, a whole bunch of us uh, decided, look, if we can get a hold of those strains, they need to be sequenced. They need to be sequenced fast. We need to understand this epidemic. 
And that's where Eric Shad came in. He took his whole team at PAC Bioscience in California, literally 20 people, and he said, we will do nothing but sequence these strains as soon as you get the DNA. So this was the study design. I don't need to go into too much detail. Suffice to say, single nucleotide polymorphisms are single bases in the DNA changes, indels or insertion deletions. This is what it looks like. This is the brave new world of, uh, of genomic uh, epidemiology. The, the patients' uh, samples were collected on November 6th. They arrived at Harvard Medical School on November 8th at 10 a.m. in my office, as it turns out. Uh, two preps of DNA were made in Matt's lab and my lab, sent out to California November 9th. Data was streaming off PAC Bioscience machines by 11 o'clock, major conclusions by 10 p.m. November 10th. These strains were, were definitely not, number one, from Peru and Latin America. There were over 200 single nucleotide polymorphisms separating Peru. You can see this little cluster of the seventh pandemic, how different this history, this genetic mapping of its, of its history is from all these other non-seventh pandemic strains. It was a seventh pandemic strain, and it was most closely related to a 2008 strain that we had in the collection, 20 single nucleotide polymorphisms. I apologize, I still forget to edit this. This is called M4. That's H1, that's M4. Anyway, uh, very, very close to contemporary South Asian strains. We did not have Nepal strains. We could not get <coughs> Nepal strains. We were actually blocked from getting Nepal strains by, among others, our colleagues in Nepal. When asked, they said, we can't do it for political reasons. In any case, a group in the, uh, in the Netherlands was eventually able to get the Nepal strains for the epidemics in the, in the September time period. The Nepal strains are Nepal 2, 3, and, and uh, 1 and 4 phylogenetically. Haiti's right in the middle. And as you can see, these little ones, 1, 1, 1, that's a single nucleotide change. So one or two nucleotide changes over a million base pairs define the difference between one of the Nepal groups that was causing disease in, in September and the epidemic broke out in October. I'm sorry, but we're left with pretty much no other conclusion. So the most likely conclusion is, in fact, cholera was introduced to Haiti probably by an infected human, maybe a symptomatic one, maybe a non-symptomatic one. That may come out in the wash someday, all we can say. Uh, and everyone agrees with us. Uh, there's been a UN panel on this, and they agree with the same conclusion. There really is no other explanation than to say that it was introduced with uh, individuals from Nepal. Um, in the future, I think relief workers, security forces from cholera endemic areas need to be treated with antibiotics or vaccines before they go to areas where that have no cholera and are at high risk for cholera. It just, it's a ridiculous decision to say it's low risk. It's too big of a tragedy or risky to not uh, uh, utilize uh, these kinds of restrictive uh, or preventative measures. And then finally, now we have a new strain that has uh, been introduced in the Americas that can cause uh, very severe disease, more severe disease than the strains that were in South Asia and in Latin America before that. And that means there's a, a risk of these strains spreading beyond Haiti. And that's already happened. You might have seen in the news that there was an, a cholera outbreak in the Dominican Republic. As it turns out, this lovely place, I'm sure it is lovely, Casa del Campo, the perfect place to have a wedding, had a very large wedding. And basically around 350 or so, well, let's see, what is this, bringing 245 number of patients treated out of 450, I think in the end, it turned out that it was closer to about 350 people that, that either seroconverted or got cholera, and every single one of them ate lobster at that wedding. Anyone who didn't eat lobster didn't get cholera. So somehow or another, the lobster just got contaminated with the Haitian strain. It's been since identified as the Haitian strain. And sure enough, there were a few cases of cholera in Boston, and as it turns out, um, the four cases of cholera in Boston were all people that went to that big Dominican Republican wedding and had lobster. <laughs> and there were a lot of cases of cholera in Venezuela, and it turns out that those were all cases of people that went to this big wedding and had lobster. So this is kind of funny. Here's the cholera virus, Fox News. Fair and balanced. <laughs> but, no, honestly, they, they did correct themselves. They did correct. It is a bacterium, but I, I, I was very mixed. 
Sorry about that mistake. <laughs> anyway, um, curious properties of variant strains. Well, um, they require a lot more fluid replacement therapy. They show higher rates of mortality. Um, they uh, show an increase in the relative risk of family members in the index case. So one can wonder what are the genotypes and phenotypes that cause these changes in virulence and infectivity. One thing is clear, these strains make a lot more cholera toxin. Multiple groups now have confirmed they make upwards of 20 times more cholera toxin in a variety of different media, and they're more pathogenic in, in animal models as well. So now I just want to give you a little bit more uh, data just to give you a further appreciation of the sort of things that we do in trying to understand all this. You don't need to be a molecular biologist to understand this. All you need to understand is that RNA is a measurement of gene expression. And this is one of the two chrom chromosomes of cholera. And where we put these red dots, it shows you just kind of visually what are the genes that are turned on when Vibrio cholera is in an infected mouse versus when it's not an infected mouse. And you can see that the concentration of red dots set, tend to be in clusters. Here's a major cluster, TCP, you know what that is now. There's the cholera toxin. There's a seventh pandemic island. There's another seventh pandemic island up here, and that's another um, uh, island. This is actually a different island. Anyway, to make a long story short, this bug has tuned in its ability to turn on genes in vivo that drive its pathogenesis. And I told you about all these in the interest of time. I won't say too very much more about them. Uh, I just want to tell you one, uh, probably one other story, because I want to try to leave some time for discussion. Um, how am I doing on time? Do I feel good? Yeah. yeah, I got some time. Good. Um, you know, these are the in vivo induced genes. One thing I do want to, I want to mention again that the Vibrio 7th Pandemic Island is a colonization infectivity factor. And then another uh, interesting fact that came up is there's a gene cluster called T6SS, it stands for type 6 secretion. And it's a system that allows bacteria to uh, inject proteins in another bacterium or another type of cell, eukaryotic cells and animal cell. And this is turned on too, and it's particularly turned on in the South Asian and Haiti variant strains, these newly emerged strains. Uh, in vivo, it's a, it's a strong induction. Bill Robbins here and Sarah Shin have studied this. Uh, it's definitely a virulence factor in mouse and rabbit models, and it's turned on in vivo. But this is the one that, this is brand new data, unpublished, but here's H1, remember that strain that I mislabeled, eight, uh, M4, Bangladesh 2008, Haiti 2010, for all intents and purposes, N Nepal uh, 2010 as well. And where you see these lines, this is deep sequencing information. With this new technology, you can generate a billion uh, bits of information very, very easily and map it onto what amounts to uh, only a million base pairs on the genome. So you can cover every single uh, base of the DNA genetic code very, very deeply. And when these are long lines, it means that gene has been turned on very, very well. There's a lot of messenger RNA for that gene cluster. And as you can see from this slide, basically the type 6 secretion system uh, is strongly uh, upregulated in these uh, variant strains compared to the low amounts of reads you see in these older strains that include the Peru strain from 1991, a very successful strain, but not turned on, and older strains, seventh pandemic strains from the 1970s. I can tell you right now that these strains, this strain and this strain, these variant strains, they've taken over South Asia. You cannot find these strains anymore in South Asia. And for the most part, they've taken over Africa too. So we know these strains have emerged as much more evolutionarily fit. And we're trying to figure out how do they do this? How do they become more evolutionarily fit? This is one smoking gun that this system may be driving their fitness. So what does that system do? Well, two postdocs uh, from my lab, uh, Joseph Mugeau and Stefan Potaski, made contributions early on into the system. Suffice to say that this system is a uh, way for a bacterium, in this case the donor being Vibrio cholera, to attack other bacteria and kill them. And it does it by attacking a polymer that gives the bacterial cell rigidity and uh, shape, the peptidoglycan. These are enzymes that chew up the peptidoglycan. 
And the other remarkable thing about it is you've heard, uh, you know, the role of phages in the emergence, but now I'm going to tell you that this secretion system has actually evolved from phages. There are multiple gene products here that look a lot like the viral structures, uh, both at the structural biology level and morphologically level, to phage parts, but, but it is not a phage. And uh, this is what our, our conclusion is of a lot of different studies, is that viruses bind to the surface of bacterial cells and inject their DNA using this apparatus. But this apparatus, while it is probably evolved from viral uh, uh, structures, looks a lot like it, it's used to inject proteins out of the bacterial cell and into target cells. This is structurally all the same to that, it's just that target cells get attacked. And I have to show you this because this is this is uh, this is uh, you know was a, a real wake up call for me. I, it made bacteria so much more alive and real. This is an example of the techniques that we use now. This is a structure that, uh, that was schematically shown in that cartoon called the sheath, and now we have a furry sheath that has fuzz on it, and the fuzz is from this green fluorescent protein, a fluorescent protein that we can watch in the microscope. So there it is. So these are bacterial cells. And this is seconds up here. Things are sped up about 50 times. But those are little machines. And those machines build, and they contract, and they get disassembled, and they get built again, and they fire over and over again. It doesn't hurt the cell to fire these things. And what they're doing is they're firing at anybody nearby. They'll fire at sister cells. They'll fire at other bacteria. When they fire at other bacteria, they shoot into them enzymes that destroy those other bacteria. So this is what you're seeing in a cartoon. This is Don Casper's uh, cartoon of a phage tail contracting. But what we are imagining now is that the predator cells, like the Borrell collar, can build this machine. And when it contracts, this contraction event, it ends up like this. And the proteins that end outside of the cell or inside a prey cell uh, are injected. And that, that is a remarkable event. It occurs uh, on a structure that's 10 times bigger than a phage tail and really amounts to effectively a micro, a nano drill, if you will, that uh, gets out of the predator cell into the prey cell. You can watch it now. Um, these are colony counts, but suffice to say, wild type Vibrio cholera kills a very common intestinal pathogen called, I mean, intestinal organism called E. coli very, very well. You don't see any coming back. These are all mutants in type 6. The E. coli is just fine. And there's the E. coli. You can see. The machine is firing, this time uh, made red with a different fusion protein, and these are the E. coli, absolutely getting smoked. Ready? Boom. So this organism has evolved and perfected a machine to attack one of the organisms in our gut, and whether it attacks it in the environment or in our gut or any other related organism, that's the part we don't know, but it's still uh, pretty fascinating to think about the ecological issues related to that. Now, I want to make a quick transition here, and then I think we're going to, we're going to end up. And that is, uh, however, other type 6 bacteria prey on Vibrio. So here's a case where Vibrio is red, and this organism, Pseudomonas ruginosa, is green. And if you look carefully, you'll see lots of little red circles and less and less Vibrios. Same, same thing I just showed you, except now the winner is the green cells. So Vibrio can get killed by Pseudomonas if it's type 6 positive. So where I want you to take that is to recognize that now, you know, now we have to think about the possibility that environmental changes that cause Pseudomonas originosa to bloom might make the water in, inhabitable for Vibrio cholera. If they're competing with each other, Vibrio can't kill Pseudomonas, but Pseudomonas can sure kill Vibrio. So it's something to keep in mind that we have to re-examine that idea. And this could all be happening in the context of aquatic organisms. Nothing saying this can't happen in the gut of a copepod, for example, or on the, on the biofilm that covers the egg casing. It's just the ecology here could be quite complex in the end. Um, what else is out hunting for Vibrio collar? Well, amoeba hunt them. They eat them. This is, happens to be a somewhat Vibrio-shaped bacterium, and this amoeba is about to engulf it and chew it up. I have a video for anybody at the end who wants to hang out and look at a cool video. That's my reminder that I got to end. And um, 
And protozoa also eat the brio collar. So you can again label the brio collar with green fluorescent protein. They're the green cells. All the green color you see in this has to do with number one, the protozoa eating the vibrio, and number two, digesting the vibrio to some extent and actually releasing uh, fluorescent molecules. So it turns out type 6 is important for that too. Stefan Potaski showed early on that amoeba can form these plaques on a lawn of vibrio cholera. That's showing the amoeba eating the vibrio cholera. But that's when they're avirulent, that is they're deleted in uh, one of the type 6 proteins. If they're type 6 positive, like this wild type 1, the amoeba can't eat them. So this system is not only something that can use the organism and utilize to kill bacteria, it can utilize them to kill eukaryotic grazers, amoeba and protozoa, that may be, again, another thing controlling its predominance, uh, its, its distribution in the environment. And then the last part of the story I'll, I'll go through very, very quickly, and that is phages. And again, there are phages in, in areas like Bangladesh that uh, dramatically uh, attack Vibrio cholera. These are viruses that eat Vibrio cholera, and you find them so much easier in the waters of Bangladesh than you do in the waters of Boston or places where there's no cholera. It's not that you know the other vir environmental vibrios are supporting the growth of these phages. These phages are very specific for the strains that are causing disease. So for example, this phage grows on 0139 and not on 01. This phage grows on 01. This phage grows on 01. These holes you see are an indication of growth and lysis of, this, of the bacterial cells by those viruses. More examples here. Now, occasionally you find a virus like this one, which will grow on O1, but it will also grow on non O1 and non O139. It's an unusual virus. It grows on more than one host. So there is the possibility that we might be able to find a, back, uh, find a Vibrio strain in the waters of Haiti that is a natural, non-pathogenic Vibrio strain and find a virus that we can introduce into an environment like that to grow on that endogenous strain so that it produces a protection zone against the O1 strains. You need to have something amplify the viruses when there's no O1s around. So it's something to think about. Anyway, the last, the last thing I'm going to say is that there's an inverse correlation. These are sort of you know, very uh, stylistic epidemic curves showing seasonality of cholera. I'm not going to go into much detail because we're out of time. And I'll just say finally that my colleague Shah Farooq in Bangladesh, uh, in a collaborative study that was funded by NIH, sampled water sites for cholera and phages. And here's really the bottom line. When you sample water over years, a three-year study, you can find water samples that are phage positive and vibrio negative, 34% of them, phage negative and vibrio cholera positive, 38 well, if you just look at those two numbers out of 221, you would predict a lot of water samples should have both. In fact, only 16 had phages and vibrio cholera, and of those, most of the vibrio cholera were insensitive to the phage, so only 5 of 114. This says there's a negative correlation between viable vibrio cholera uh, in the water and phages, and this is the way that we, we published the study some years back. When cholera is high, phages are low. When phages are high, which are the, the red bars in this case, you can see the red bars are high when the cholera peaks drop. Here's another dramatic example. Cholera high, phages low. Epidemic crashes, phages high. And it works for sero groups. And here's the bottom line. There's a reciprocal relationship. It's quite striking. When phages are high, disease rates are low. It's sero group specific. So it really sounds like a very phage-specific phenomenon, in my opinion. And in the inter-epidemic period, there's high concentrations of both O1 and O139, and there's just no O1 and O139 disease. So here's our model. We believe that, in general, uh, you could have two sero groups of cholera. Uh, if the epidemic curves look like this, what we're envisioning is that something happens where there's a vibrio cholera in the water and there's no phages that can attack it. They're not the right color. So you end up with a lot more Vibrio cholera in the water, and then a phage takes over. It kills off those blue cells, so you have lots of phages in the water, but the red cells, different serogroup, are resistant to these blue phages. So then you have disease due to another serogroup, and eventually a red phage emerges that says, ah, lunch, and then you end up with this. And that's what the interepidemic period looks like, is lots of phages and not a lot of viable Vibrio cholera. So our conclusions are that 
Phage blooms likely correlate with the collapse of epidemics. We still can't say what causes an epidemic to begin. We, uh, we believe it could correlate with no phages in the water, but we don't like the idea that cholera is always there, ready to pounce. But maybe that's part of the story. I, I tend to believe that Rita Caldwell is correct, that there is probably an environmental factor that blooms, that, that particularly produces uh, high uh, amounts of Vibrio cholera in the water, but only when there's no phages around. Uh, that's where I think our, our, our two models uh, separate from each other. And we believe phages probably block transmission. There's lots of circumstantial evidence, including experimental evidence, that in fact, if you have you know, enough phages around, there's just not enough viable Vibrio cholera to, to produce an infection uh, in a significant way. So we hope someday we might be able to introduce phages into the settings like Haiti and see if we can alter uh, the epidemic profile of, of that disease if vaccines don't solve the problem there. And then finally, uh, emergence of new variant strains, like uh, the variant strain that was introduced into Haiti from South Asia, um, have lots of changes. They've coupled, they changed virulence factors, they've changed environmental fitness factors, maybe driven by the type 6 locus, as one example that I talked to you about today. And uh, I think uh, we're faced as microbiologists with you know, a challenge for the future that these organisms respond, they change to, to settings that we put uh, you know, evolutionary pressure uh, on them. And uh, I think uh, they're, they're very capable of changing their properties to take advantage of, uh, of the parameters that we present them with. So I'll stop there, just give some credit to my group. I tried to mention some of the names along the way. There's a few people missing. Stefan Potaski and Joseph Mujo were early type 6 folks. Uh, Merrick is currently still in the lab and has done one, that wonderful video microscopy. Amy did her thesis in the lab on type 6. June was a postdoc and also worked on type 6. Sarah did some type 6 work. And Brian uh, also is Brian uh, Ho, uh, is, a, uh, is a graduate student that's working on type 6. And Brian Davies is a postdoc that did the in vivo, some of the in vivo work I talked about today. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks.